Why did Taylor Swift make this song? Taylor Swift wrote on her Instagram for when she released her song Carolina for the book Where the Crawl Dad Sings. About a year and a half ago, I wrote a song about an incredible story. The story of a girl who always lived on the outside looking in, figuratively and literally. The juxtaposition of her loneliness and independence, her longing and her stillness, her curiosity and fear all tingled up. Her persisting gentleness and the world's betrayal of it. I wrote this one alone in the middle of the night. And then Aaron Dressner and I meticulously worked on the sound that we felt would be authentic to the moment in time when the story takes place. I made a wish that one day you would hear it. And what exactly did Delilah Owens write that made Taylor Swift feel this way? Taylor Swift discusses our main character, Kaya. She's a girl who always lived on the outside looking in, and she also talks about the juxtaposition of her loneliness and independence. So in this story, Kaya really struggles with the fact she has this deep need for connection. But due to literally her entire family leaving her, she just wants to be alone. And the only place she's ever felt safe in is the marsh. And the thing is that if she's alone, no one can ever leave her, no one can ever hurt her. But that changes for Kaya when we meet Tate. Tate is a boy that she's known since she was a little girl. He helps her find her way home one day when she's lost out in the marsh and she's still trying to maneuver on her own. He eventually teaches her how to read by drawing her in, by sharing different bird leaves with her. So they have this common connection, which is their love for the marsh. But eventually Tate has to go off to college and he promises that he's gonna come back. But then he doesn't because he's too afraid of how he feels about her and whether or not she's ever gonna leave the marsh and then he just doesn't know what to do about it and so he just stays away. And this destroys Kaya. She literally shuts off her heart and she's like, I'm not letting anyone back in ever again. You were the one person I thought I could trust after everyone deserted me. And she doesn't even deal with it. She just literally like shuts the door, puts her feelings deep down and it's like, I'm not going to deal with those and I'm not going to let anyone else come in. But because we're humans and we desire connection, after years pass by, she notices this handsome boy Chase. He was the quarterback for the Barkley Cove school. He has a nice body. <laughs> and they share a moment where they lock eyes and Kaya feels like she's never been seen like this before. And she's not only craving connection, she's craving touch. And she's very confused on what it is she wants from Chase. And not only that, Chase's friends that he hangs out with, a couple of girls, Kaya sees them, she spies on them from behind the bushes, and she remembers her ma telling her about how important it is to have connection with your female friends, to have that sisterhood. But yet she just sits there, hiding behind the bush, staring at them, spying on them. And I totally get it. Like, it's definitely hard to make friends, but I'm also not Kaya, who has been pushed aside by society so it's even harder for her. And so we get this struggle with Kaya where she literally keeps herself so far at a distance where she's like the animals in the woods. She's spying on them, not getting too close. She's scared of them. But if she spies, she can still be close enough where she feels like she's getting just a hint of it, but she's still far away enough to keep her heart protected from not getting hurt. Agony ripped her. Finally, after a lifetime, she admitted it was the chance of seeing Tate the hope of rounding a creek bend and watching him through reeds that had pulled her into the marsh every day for her life since she was seven. She knew his favorite lagoons and paths through difficult quagmires, always following him at a safe distance, sneaking about, stealing love, never sharing it. You can't get hurt when you love someone from the other side of the estuary. All the years she rejected him, she survived because he was somewhere in the marsh, waiting. Kaya is really struggling to understand herself. She's physically attracted, to, sexually attracted to him, but emotionally she also needs to feel close to someone. Chase shows interest, but eventually Kaya starts to realize that this is kind of about him having everything he wants and not giving any part of himself. And this makes Kaya shut down even more because when the relationship ends, because she literally finds out in the newspaper that he's engaged to another girl in town because that's what Chase did. He got around to everyone. He literally wanted to have his cake and eat it too and give nothing of himself to Kaya. So they break up and she's like, I'm done. I'm gonna be alone. I'm gonna be isolated forever. I don't need anyone. I should have known this from the first place. The wall is so high up that no one could get in. But again, she's so lonely and this kills her that her brother Jody, who was the closest to her in age, he sees her book published and he finally realizes that she's still alive in the marsh. He goes and visits her and she's so happy, but she, she also just discovered her ma died a couple years ago and everything's just kind of hitting her again. But Jody is there, he's here for her and he's also 
trying to remind her that Tate is a good guy and that he made mistakes and that this is what humans do. Like, we're not perfect. And, you know, Kaya tries to say like, oh, well, this is just how men are. I've learned that from nature. And Jody's like, no, I've been with plenty of women who have also burned me too. And he's really trying to to be there for her and, and show her that humans are different because Kaya is so connected to the Martian nature that this is really where her upbringing has been. So this kind of makes Kaya think, well, maybe I could just be his friend and we don't have to be too close. But again, she's isolated in the marsh and this is the only place she's known. And it's hard because I myself have been burned plenty of times and to be left alone as a little girl, I can't even imagine. So I do empathize and understand why Kaya shuts a wall so high around herself, but it still breaks my heart. But then there's also something so beautiful about how she's allowed nature to wrap her up because in reality, and this is something Delilah Owens talks about in her, in her author notes in the back of the book, is that mother nature is always there. She's always there providing for us. She's always there showing us some piece of beauty. And we at so many times neglect her and don't appreciate her. And that's the thing is that because the marsh has given so much to Kaya, she gives it everything and she, she feels warm and safe in it constantly. Again, like I'm saying, this isn't Kaya's fault. And so it's even more hard to wrap your brain around when the town is saying that she's the one who killed Chase, which, spoiler, she has. But it's more so about how the town immediately looked at her because they've put her on the outside. They made her the marsh girl, not the other way around. Kaya was forced to become the Marsh Girl because they wouldn't accept her into society. They forced her to be an outsider. And after she's found innocent and she comes home and Jody's with her, he wants to stay with her, but Kaya just wants to be left alone with the one thing that's always been true to her and always had her back, which is the Marsh. And she's getting really upset at Jody and he's like, look, I get that you hate these people. And she's like, no, I don't hate them. I've never hated them. And this is, this is what she wants people to understand. That's what nobody understands about me. She raised her voice. I never hated people. They hated me. They attacked me. Well, it's true. I learned to live without them, without you, without Ma, or anybody. However, what is Kaya's fault is that up until this point, post case, Jody has come back into her life. He's like, here's my address and my phone number. I'm gonna be here for you every step of the way. Tate even came back and apologized and has tried several attempts to be back in her life just as a friend. He also respects her every time. She's like, we can't get too close because I've been hurt too much. And he understands and respects that, but he still wants to be there for her and care for her. And Jody keeps trying to explain to her that humans are different. They're not just like all the animals. And so because Jody won't leave post trial because he's really concerned, he wants to be there for her, but Kai is so upset, she leaves the shack and goes out onto the beach to be with her seagulls because those have been her only friends, her only form of friendship she's understood. And Jody gets frustrated and upset and he goes, well, I don't want to force my sister out of her home or the one place that she feels safe, so he leaves. Kaya finally comes back into the shack and she starts painting and she starts crying and she's so upset and she's like, why am I so angry? Why am I so mad? And this is the thing is that after everything that's happened, which is understandable, but now there are changes being made. There are people trying to stay constant. She's making the choice to keep them out and be isolated. But again, she's only had the marsh to teach her things. So she's confused and she doesn't understand why she's so upset and why she pushes people away. Truth be told, the only people Kaya's ever really truly let into her life and be a constant is Jumpin' and Mabel. But she made sure that she never owed them anything. She picked mussels since she was a little girl. She went fishing and fried those fish and always paid for every piece of fuel and food she needed from them. She didn't wanna owe anyone anything. And I think she learned this because of her father, because after everyone left, Pa was the only one there, but Pa kept telling her that she had to earn her keep. She had to take care of the house. She had to find a way to bring in food and, and take care of him. And then when she did that, he showed her a lot of love up until he didn't. And he got the letter from Ma and got upset and he left. So Kaya's like, I can't know anyone anything. I have to take care of myself. The way people are gonna respect me is if I don't bother them and I just leave them alone because everyone left her. So of course she feels that way. And she was such a young girl when this happened. And the only people left was really the townspeople. And every time they turned her back on her. So what else was she supposed to do? Kaya knew it wasn't so much that the herd would be incomplete without its deer, but that each deer would be incomplete without her herd. The marsh teaches her gentleness. As she rides her boat through different swamp areas, she'll lower the engine not to disturb the animals. 
She likes to give them her space. And like I said, also, the seagulls are her best friends. She goes to them every day and feeds them to the point that when she's in jail, she asks Tate the one time she sees him, can you feed them? And he's out feeding them every day for her already. He gets Kaya. And she could sit for hours on the beach just watching the tide roll in and out and just be connected to them. And this is also something that Delilah talks about in her author notes. The point of where the crawl dad sings is because crawl dads don't sing. But if you're out way yonder, which is quoted in the book where the crawl dad sings, literally out so far in nature away from civilization, you just sit there, you can hear everything. And that's what Kaya lives for. She sleeps on the beach half the time because hearing the sounds from the marsh make her feel safer than being in her home where she could potentially hear people running up on her. If anyone understood loneliness, the moon would. Drifting back to the predictable cycles of the tadpoles and the ballet of the fireflies, Kaya burrowed deeper into the wordless wilderness. Nature seemed the only stone that would not slip midstream. Always afraid of the world that pushed her away, always hiding, she literally only went to school for one day and spying on others for some form of connection. Her love for nature and the love that it had for her and her curiosity of needing to learn everything about the marsh. And it was easy because society kept pushing her away. Yet in reality, she was only an abandoned child, a little girl surviving on her own in the swamp, hungry and cold, but we didn't help her. We called her the marsh girl. Now scientific institutions recognize her as the marsh expert. Taylor's song is entirely from Kaya's perspective. The marsh is in her veins, it knows her best, she's forever alone. Taylor even has a line that says, into the clouds and into the mist, and that's where Kaya wanders. Another line, the places she won't go, that's town, that's Barkley Cove, that's where society rejects her and never accepts her. So when Taylor says, Carolina only knows, that's not just referring to everything that Kaya's felt her entire life, but it's also what she did to chase and why she had to do it. It's what she needed to do in order to survive. Female fireflies draw in strange males with dishonest signals and eat them. Mantis females devour their own mates. Female insects, Kaya thought, know how to deal with their lovers. And Delilah even says in discussion questions, in the end of the novel, Kaya thinks most of what she knew she learned from the wild. Nature had nurtured, tutored, and protected her when no one else would. If consequences resulted from her behaving differently, then they were two functions of the life's fundamental core. And mind you, Kaya goes after Chase and kills him because he attempts to rape her at one point. She's able to fight her way out of it, but after that, she's terrified and scared that he won't stop hunting her because he makes it clear that she's only his and she has to remember that and no one else gets to have her. So she's terrified for her life and she thinks about how her ma lived and why her ma left and she doesn't wanna live that way anymore. She doesn't wanna live in fear. So this truly makes me believe that when Kaya says she's not guilty in the court and pleads that, I feel that Kaya truly believes she is not guilty because society pushed her away, forced her to become the Marsh girl, and that's all she knew. The Marsh taught her how to live in society, thus she wasn't a part of the town and their laws. Taylor also says, Carolina Pines, won't you cover me? She's referring to every time someone's chased her down, whether it was the truancy officer or bullies coming to her house in the middle of the night or the sheriffs coming to arrest her for killing Chase. And another line, you didn't see me here, they never saw me. She was the marsh girl that they chose to ignore. So Kaya learned how to hide, how to not be seen, how to not be continuously rejected. So she knew how to hide really well. And so therefore she knew how to go after Chase and not get caught. What Kaya did, I believe Kaya firmly believes that what she did is between her and Carolina. A swamp knows all about death and doesn't necessarily define it as a tragedy, certainly not as a sin. She meets no ghosts in her sleep because she doesn't believe what she did was wrong. It's what an animal has to do to survive, whether or not it's good or bad. Delilah Owens, the author, also spent many years isolated studying different animals out in Africa. So she knows what it means to be alone and isolated for a very long time and how much it can really affect the psyche. I mean, I work from home most days by myself and, and that can sometimes be hard on me. I can't imagine just being out in nature with no human connection for days. I think that really does change the nurture in you because you're left to nature at that point because no one nurtured you. So it changes everything about how you see the world. Delilah even says that nature is her ever-present friend. 
She's always there to soften a blow, to hold me, to teach me, to forgive me. She stays when others go. I believe that we felt these things, that Taylor felt these things so strong because they came from Delilah herself. She infused them into Kaya. She, and she was vulnerable in sharing these experiences and how they make a person feel. He identified some odd species, then stepped back watching her. She feels the pulse of life, he thought, because there are no layers between her and her planet. Are you a daydreamer like me? Well, if you are, you can join my Patreon at the $5 tier a month, and you get early access to all my videos there before anyone else on the channel sees them. So I walked into this story completely blind. All I knew was Taylor Swift's song, and that was it. I saw the movie first, and I'm kind of happy I did, because then when I got to disappear into the book, it gave me so much more, as books usually do. I truly feel Taylor really encaptured the feeling, the vibe of this book, a lot of what Delilah was trying to say, but again, all through Kaya's perspective, all through her voice and what she went through. And because we have Delilah's first-hand experience of being isolated in nature and the pros and cons of that, we really just get to feel truth in this story, vulnerability, and the rawness of it, which is why I think so many people have connected to it. Even before having watched the movie or read the book and just having Taylor Swift's song, I felt there was some mystery, there was, there was something lying there that I just didn't know about, but I wanted to know more, I needed to know more. And I feel that that's what Delilah did and how she wrote this book out of order and kind of leaving drops here and there for you to sort of piece it all together. And again, I'm happy that I went in blind and I got to savor the book second. I really now want to watch the movie over again and kind of re-experience it all. I'm not one to reread books often, but I think this is one I would reread again just because there's so many things in it that you can pick up and relate to or just so many beautiful things on how Delilah relates Kaya's life to nature and things to learn ourselves from nature and how to appreciate and respect her more. And I think the movie did a great job adapting the film. It feels like the story, everything is almost perfect. The only things I have an issue with is that I wish they had done the death of Tate's father. I feel like that was really important to his character, especially because his father really taught him how to be a vulnerable and kind, loving man who really feels and cries and works hard rather than acting like Chase, who was more of a brute. I also wish they hadn't tiptoed so much around the fact that Kaya killed Chase. It felt very uneventful at the end and a little bit confusing as to whether or not it actually happened. The only clue we had was the necklace versus in the book, it hits much more on the head about how it potentially went down. It's still ominous in the book, but it's much more clearer. And I don't know why they didn't want to show that. So I made a playlist for Kaya of songs that I felt really just reflected how she felt and the journey she went through. So if you wanna check that out, it's in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next imaginary world that we visit. It's gonna be the way of King's reaction number three, by the way.